Good morning, everyone. I am, uh, I'm Jason Lazar. Um, I have the good fortune of serving as the Executive Vice Dean of the College of Medicine. And uh, good morning to all of us, those of us who are here in person and the many attendees through, uh, who are joining us via live stream. On behalf of the College of Medicine Dean, Charles Brunicardi, welcome to our second annual bioethics symposium entitled Ethical Considerations for Public Health, which is generously being sponsored by the John Connolly Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities at Downstate. Our special thanks goes to the John Connolly Foundation for Ethics and Philosophy in Medicine for their generous support of our Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities, which they have supported since their first gift to us in 2002. Dr. John Connolly, a pioneer in treating head and neck cancers, was a close friend of our former chair of otolaryngology, Dr. Frank Lucente. It is through this lifelong friendship that Dr. Lucente had with Dr. Connolly and his wife, Dr. Monica Connolly, that we were able to showcase the work of, uh, that was done by Dr. Kathleen Powderly in medical ethics. This uh, eventually led to the establishment of the John Connolly Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities. This partnership with the Connolly family is why our program in medical ethics is as strong as it is today. Because of this support, we have continued to conduct critically important work through the John Connolly Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities. Our Connolly scholars and faculty continue to be active teachers, advocates, and researchers who view bioethics as a critical field of study. And in these very challenging times for healthcare, high quality activities focused on ethics, and in this particular case, addressing the similarities and differences in individualized medical care and those of public health bioethics are even more important and in great demand. Today's symposium will address some of these important issues. In general, medical ethics applies to individual interactions between healthcare providers and patients, whereas public health bioethics applies to interactions between an institution and community or a population. Accordingly, today's symposium is the culmination of collaborative efforts of the College of Medicine, School of Public Health, College of Nursing, College of Health Professions, and School of Graduate Studies. In particular, Dean Brunicardi and I would like to recognize and express our deepest gratitude for the outstanding relationships that exist within the individual colleges of SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University, which is really a tribute to our institution's leadership, including the deans of their respective schools. I'd like to also thank the organizers of today's symposium, Dr. Thomas Mackey and Dr. Sheldon Landisman, and the arduous efforts of Ms. Taryn Toval Turpin. I look forward to hearing today's presentations. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Ron Baer, co-director in the Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, of which I am an alumnus. And this will be followed by our, our plenary speaker, Dr. Nir Ayal, the Henry Rutgers Professor of Bioethics and Director of the Center of Population Level Bioethics. And to introduce our first speaker, I'd like to call upon Dr. Sheldon Landisman. First, I would like to thank all of you for coming and all the people who ha helped make this, uh, this conference possible. Um, it really is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ron Baer. We've known each other for, I guess, four, four, um, four, four decades, uh, dating back to the early days of the AIDS epidemic, uh, where uh, Ron Howard Minkoff, who's here, Susan Holman, myself, Jack DeHovitz, who couldn't be here, worked uh, on the AIDS epidemic here at uh, Downstate, Kings County, uh, when we were one of the epicenters of it. Uh, Ron, at that point in time, was at the uh, 
Hastings Center for Bioethics, really the fountainhead for bioethics in the country. Uh, many of its most famous graduates went out, went out to establish other bioethics uh, programs uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country. And uh, Ron, um, who had a history of, uh, of dealing with uh, issues with uh, gay men, homosexuality, and ethics, okay, was a leader in the ethical challenges of the AIDS epidemic, which at its heart, how do you, um, how do you control an epidemic when you didn't have an agent, when the uh, people who were infected were asymptomatic and capable of spreading it for a decade, okay, and when the acts that drove the epidemic were private, personal, instinctual, and um, not amenable to the controlling police powers of the state. Ron was the, um, the leader in the ethical challenges of that epidemic. Uh, and much of what he did uh, is still with us, still with us today. As the epidemic waned a bit, as we got some treatment underway, he did many other things, including issues of smoking, electronic cigarettes, but mostly he continued to work in the realm of public health ethics and can be considered one of the founders of the whole idea of public health, uh, public health ethics. It's really uh, my distinct pleasure of having him uh, speak here. You can tell I, I uh, never went to medical school uh, because I don't use slides. Uh, I, uh, I had a, uh, when Sheldon told me about today's event, it was clear that there were going to, other than near, there would be other people on the panel. And so uh, I'm going to keep my keynote comments relatively brief. I actually try to trim them down, but to hit the points as careful as I can. So uh, let me begin. Excuse me? Hello? Okay. Hello? Good. Uh, so, five decades ago, John Rawls, the preeminent political philosopher in the latter part of the 20th century, wrote in his landmark volume, A Theory of Justice, justice is the first virtue of social institutions. Social justice provides a way of assigning rights and duties. It defines the appropriate distribution of benefits and burdens of social cooperation. So it is to the question of justice that I want to turn today as we examine the ethical challenges we confront in addressing the profound inequalities that characterize not only our healthcare system, but health in the United States. It is especially pertinent as we address these issues that we bring to bear the ethical mission of public health as distinct from clinical ethics. The mission of public health is to enhance population well-being, reduce premature mortality, limit preventable morbidity and suffering, and to address the social inequalities that give rise to the inequitable distribution of patterns of sickness and death. Thus, public health is founded either implicitly or ex explicitly on two overriding moral imperatives. They are often reinforcing, but sometimes in tension. Utilitarianism, the enhancement of the well-being at the population level, the greatest good for the greatest number, and justice, which sees in inequalities, that is, a measure of difference, inequities, a judgment about fairness. There's a long history dating to the early 19th century of advocates for public health and those who supported them with research linking social inequalities to health inequalities. In its contemporary expression, social inequality is conceptualized as the driver of health inequalities in society. 
inequality today is greater than any point in the last half, in the United States, is greater than any point in the last half century. In a widely discussed book, the French economist Thomas Piketty wrote a detailed statistical analysis of inequalities in all capitalist societies. But he went on to say that the nature of the inequality was not a foregone conclusion. It wasn't dictated by the economy itself. Inequality, he wrote, is a natural consequence of the dynamics of capitalist economics. But we need not be prisoners of those dynamics. The history of the distribution of wealth has always been deeply political and cannot be reduced to purely economic mechanisms. The history of inequality is shaped in, by the way economic, social, and political actors view what is just and what is unjust, as well as by the relative power of those actors and the collective choice that results. It's important to keep this in mind because I think Americans tend to hide from the realities of what our health, not only what our healthcare system is like, but what our distribution of health is like. We have long been aware of profound inequalities in our healthcare system. Although the Affordable Care Act has ushered in a major transformation in healthcare protection, that is, at this point, less than 10% of Americans have no health insurance. But that figure masks an enduring inequality. 13% of blacks have no health insurance. 25% of Hispanics have no health insurance. And what counts as health insurance sometimes is really, if not tragic, laughable. It turns out that, strikingly, more than 100 million Americans still struggle to pay for their health care. So from the perspective of public health, we have failed in terms of clinical care, but we have also failed at a population level. A decade ago, the National Academy of Sciences produced a report painting a grim picture, comparing the US to other advanced democratic capitalist societies. We were, it turned out, not the best, not even the second best. We were basically at the bottom of the heap when compared to other nations. This is what the report wrote. The United States has higher rates of adverse birth outcomes, heart disease, injuries from motor vehicle accidents, and violence, sexually acquired diseases, and chronic lung disease. Americans lose more years of life to alcohol and other drugs. The United States has the highest incidence of AIDS, and it has for decades experienced the highest rate of obesity in children and adults, and diabetes from age 20 onward. Only those who survived age 75 escaped this pattern. The report concluded in a striking way. It described what it said was the American disadvantage. We live in a society that has long tolerated inequality. Prevailing social norms focused on notions of the benefits of unfettered individualism and the myth of Horatio Alger. As the nations of Western Europe embraced the visions and the benefits of the welfare state after World War II, the very concept of the welfare state was almost anathema. Even when Americans embraced the notion of some social responsibility for those at the bottom, social equality was rarely, if ever, the guiding principle. It's, it's facing the in facing the challenge of meeting the housing needs of the unhoused, the poorly housed. Americans sometimes talked about the importance of having some federal public response, some federal public responsibility. But rarely, never actually, did anyone challenge the existence of lower types of housing and the existence of Park Avenue suites. Even when we talked about the importance of good public school education for all, we never challenged the existence of, of uh, 
prep schools designed for the wealthy that serve the children of the wealthy. When, America, when Americans were willing to consider the, the patterns of, of the state of affairs, they almost universally avoided the problem of equity. But something is different about health. In health, for those who are willing to address the problematic situation of access to health care in America, somehow in health, inequities, in inequalities, very quickly were defined as inequities. They embraced in many different ways the notion of a right to health care. What was the significance of the decision to, uh, to uh, refer to a right to health care, to use the notion of a right to health care as a platform for analyzing that which existed and having a vision of that which should be created. The language of rights has its origins in the claims of individuals to be free of unjustified constraints. It has its roots in the struggle against the absolute estates of the 18th and 19th century. In the late 19th century, a transformation occurred in Europe as social democrats began to argue for social rights, positive rights, based on claims that the state had a duty to provide for the basic needs of its citizens. They asserted that unless such positive rights were fulfilled, meeting the social needs of the populace, the traditional liberal rights, right of liberty, freedom of expression would be hollow. In the United States, the language of rights has been the most potent language available to those who have felt aggrieved and for those who have sought to speak out on their behalf. As the philosopher Joel Feinberg wrote, rights provide a platform upon which one can stand, not to beg or plead for solicitude, for charity, for kindness, but to demand what was one's due. It was that perspective that informed efforts to confront the inequalities in the American healthcare system as part of the challenge of bioethics as it emerged in the late 1960s and early 1970s in the context of struggles against racism, inequality for women, the birth of the feminist movement, deplorable examples of abuse of research subjects. Looking back at those years, considerable effort was devoted to thinking about the allocation of scarce medical resources, prioritization, who should get the organs when not all could get the organs, who should have access to dialysis. So it was to address these issues of inequality in healthcare as inequity that Norman Daniels, the philosopher who drew upon John Rawls sought to explain why healthcare was different, why it was not simply another commodity, why justice should determine the patterns of distribution. This is what he wrote. The central moral importance of preserving and treating disease and disability with effective healthcare services derives from the way in which protecting normal function contributes to protecting opportunity. That, by the way, is a very American notion, the idea of protecting equal opportunity to compete. Specifically, by keeping people close to normal functioning, healthcare preserves for people the ability to participate in the political, social, and econo economic life of society. It sustains them as fully participating citizens, normal col collaborators, and competitors in all spheres of social life. <clears throat> but given this starting point, does distributive justice require that everyone have access to the full range of services that might be needed? Did it suggest a robust basic minimum or something much more? Would it permit that some fee for service be charged? And if not, why not? Should those who engage in pathogenic behaviors, sometimes described unfortunately as willful uh, engagement with pathogenic behaviors like smoking, 
Should they be charged something extra for the health care demands that are created by the diseases they developed because of what they did? And if we did not charge them for that, was it an unfair burden on those who chose to, quote, live healthy lifestyles? Finally, must the just health care system provide a floor below which no one could fall, but a ceiling above which no one could rise? This final question was addressed by Amy Gutman, who in time would go on to assume a leadership position, American Bioethics, the presidency of the University of Pennsylvania, and I understand she's now the American ambassador to Germany. She carefully addressed, th this is what she tried to address. Um, she carefully examined the following egalitarian proposition. No health care should be available to anyone that is not available to everyone. Two strong arguments could be made for that position. A moral one based on the fundamental obligation to protect everyone as equals. Secondly, she used a pragmatic claim. The existence of a private market would allow the privilege to gain access to medical interventions not available to the average citizen and would inevitably drain resources and talent available in, public, in the public spheres. As an example, we might think of what happens when the rich take their kids out of public schools and what is left in public schools as, as the rich provide for their children in private schools. In the end, she retreated from the strict egalitarian, egalitarian position for pragmatic political reasons. She wrote, given the great economic inequalities of our society, it is politically impossible for advocates of equal access to fulfill their task. No democratic legislator could possibly succeed in winning support for a proposal that restricted market freedoms. To insist upon strict philosophical standards, one risked throwing out the possibility of greater access to health care for the poor with the insistence upon curtailing access for the rich. Hence, it was the profound social inequalities in our society that paradoxically would make a totally egalitarian healthcare system politically impossible. But what if it turned out, what if it turned out that improving our healthcare system, even dramatically, providing equal access to healthcare services contributed to import, importantly to equal opportunity but could not assure equal opportunity. I want to take a step back just for a moment. July 5th, 1948 was the founding date of the British National Health Service. When the, federal, when the government of England announced this new program for the people of England, it said, the government, de the government declared in billboards, anyone can use it, that is the healthcare system. There are no limits no fees to pay. You can use any part of it or all of it as you wish. The Minister of Health underscored the moral foundations of the National Health Service. No society can be legitimately call itself civilized if a sick person is denied medical care because of a lack of means. Remarkably, 50 years after the creation of the National Health Service, an epidemiological study undertaken in Great Britain of the British Civil Service, they're called the Whitehall Studies, found that after 50 years of free health care to all, inequalities persisted, marked by social difference, in the United States, as I mentioned earlier, the National Academy of Sciences, after describing the American disadvantage, said, while improving the American healthcare system would be important, it could never address the issue completely. The issues had to, the social drivers, economic and social drivers, had to be addressed. And then Norman Daniels, who had made his name 
by articulating the importance of a right to health care in the name of equal opportunity, Norman Daniels wrote the following in 2012. Producing an equitable distribution of health in society requires more than universal health care. It requires that we address the social inequalities that are the drivers of health inequalities. But how much social equity would be needed to remedy the inequitable patterns of morbidity and mortality? And here, the Whitehall studies had an explosive conclusion. In looking at the British Civil Service, it found that at every level of the British Civil Service, those somewhat above, those somewhat below, those below did better in terms of life expectancy. Michael Marmot, who is a central figure in the Whitehall studies, wrote the following. There is something powerful that influences health that is correlated with hierarchy itself. It operates not only on some underprivileged minority of them over there at the margins of society to be spurned or cherished depending upon one's ideological affiliation, but on all of us, and its effects are large. These observations suggest that some underlying causal process correlates with hierarchy which expresses itself through different diseases. That is, it is a social, uh, it is not simply deep social inequality that is a problem. It is the existence of hierarchies. None of this is to suggest that the ongoing struggle to make the US healthcare system more just, more fair, more bearable is unimportant. It will remain with us. But it does make clear that if we are committed to social justice, much more needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, my own area is health informatics. And I was, uh, something I've given some thought to is that um, almost all advances, advances in technology, other spheres um, of advances in healthcare and medicine have the potential to perpetuate inequity with, without, with no malice, mm -hmm. but without, in, without any sort of corrective mechanism. Would you say that's a reasonable assertion? Yes. Uh, uh, there are, there's a uh, very famous couple uh, uh, that said, actually wrote uh, a, an article that described the inevitable fact that advances in healthcare perpetuate social inequalities. And they made that case saying, even as we advance healthcare, we need to make sure that we're addressing the, uh, the underlying problems. And it involves not only medical interventions. We have done a hugely successful job in reducing the prevalence of smoking in the United States. Um, it, it, at the beginning, of the, in the 60s, 50% of, of men, 34, 40% of women smoked. The numbers are now down to about 12% of the population smokes or less. But the amazing thing is that enormous achievement in terms of population health has resulted in a, uh, a gr incredible social disparities. Those with a graduate degree, less than 2% smoke. Those with the GED, about 30% smoke. So the well-to-do, the middle class, etc., have achieved greater health, but we have left behind, that is, the progress created the inequality. And that is something we have to deal with. Wonderful talk, Ron, and I agreed with every word message that the social determinants are where the action is, uh, is a message of hope, but also potentially a message of despair, because it's not easy to change the social determinants. We know much more about medical science than we know about how to shape society, how to, what even, if we were able to shape society in, in a certain mold, would bring about a stable uh, situation of equality and prosperity. Take the example that you ended up with the Whitehall study 
it's really the hierarchy itself that did the job. The, 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 um, people high up in the civil service, they don't get paid the kind of salaries that the CEOs in America expect to be paid nowadays, which has have nothing to do with the lower ranking employees. And many, they, they owe, a lot of them live in London, exposed to the same pollution. It's really just the, the very fact that you are ranked somewhere. And it's hard to imagine a social, you know, a way to organize society that avoids something like that. So what do we do about all that? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the, uh, the effort to try to understand what it is about hierarchies that create these dis enduring disparities often comes up against what you have just said. Can you imagine an advanced economic society that doesn't have some form of hierarchy. And even if salary differentials are, are constrained, even if taxes are used to equalize income, uh, there is something about having more that appears, uh, uh, for important reasons, to have health consequences. And that is something, what it requires, it seems to me, is we have to acknowledge the persistence of inequalities in health and life expectancy and ask what can we do to remedy the situation. In other words, not to avoid the challenge, but to struggle with it. Um, th thank you very much. This is a, a fascinating um, talk and a really provocative and thought-provoking one, really critical, I think, as well, to our mission here at Downstate to advance health equity. And um, I, I was particularly um, curious about your reflections on, you know, when we think about our country relative to others, we know we present, we, we um, pay more as a percentage of our GDP on health care than any other country, but we see, as you have suggested, worse health outcomes and certainly greater inequities um, in those expendi uh, in, as a result of those expenditures. And of course, we also know that if we look at um, the total amount of expenditures spent on both social and health policies in this country as, as opposed to others, we actually end up spending about equivalent. We just spend less on social policy mm -hmm. uh, for social services than we do for health services and other industrialized. I think it's a really important implication to the argument you make that we need to reallocate our financial expenditures to align with this notion that we, to improve health, we need to improve social service delivery and not just healthcare services. And I'm just curious around your thoughts on, you know, what can we uh, learn from other nations or other ways that, that conceptualizations of improving health have advanced in other contexts that may be of use to us here in the United States in solving our enduring issues? Uh, let me take a step back and point something out. Um, uh, beginning with the New Deal and then and then Second World War and afterwards, uh, America had become more equal than it had been in prior decades. The change began to occur in around 1970, where decisions were made. You know, it, what, what Piketty says, some decisions were being made. Decisions were made beginning in the 1970s in terms of taxation, et cetera. Decisions were made that created greater and greater social inequality. It didn't have to be that way. We were better off in 1970 in terms of equality than we are now. It wasn't an accident. Uh, and I don't think it's simply a matter of, it depends on how you define, uh, I mean, do, do you, how do we reduce expenditures on health care without hurting the people who need health care? Now, you know, there, one of the things that people talked about is how we have to learn to accept limits. That maybe we ought to impose limits on new developments in medical care that can, we cannot afford. Uh, or maybe we should ration them. You know, the National Health Service at one point decided that only people over 50, under 55 years of age would be eligible for dialysis. And in explaining that, and this was in a system that was providing universal coverage for everyone, in, in, in deciding to limit dialysis to people under 55, someone actually said, 
off the record, people over 55 are actually are a bit crumbly anyway. Uh, so, uh, and my, the, the director of my, my uh, Hastings Center when I was there, Daniel Callahan, wrote a very controversial book in which he argued that people, oh, I think he said 65, or maybe it was 70, should not be eligible for life-sustaining therapies. That is, they'd lived a full life, and if we're going to cover everyone for what they need, we have to impose limits. He was excoriated for that. Callahan was not a foolish, thoughtless person. And maybe if he'd said 80, it would have been less problematical. Um, but uh, so a colleague of mine actually wrote an essay talking about rationing of health care. Uh, and he said, um, America hasn't gained the right to ration because if it took care of the needs it needs to take care of, the issue wouldn't present itself in the same way. So I think it was the state of Oregon or Washington was uh, rationing health care to people on Medicaid and not to people who were in, in the state assembly, state government, but to people who were on Medicaid. And it wanted to give them, it, it felt it couldn't afford to do everything. Of course it could afford to do everything. It chose not to. And because it chose not to, it then said, we have to find an ethical way of making the decision to ration. Two points. One is that don't we ration already? I mean, the difference between Medicare, which was designed basically for elderly middle class folks, okay, uh, versus Medicaid, where the reimbursement system results in people in clinics where there are 150 patients waiting with three providers to see them, and no physician wants to care for them. Don't we already ration it? We just don't call it that. We're afraid to? Yes, you're right. I mean, the fact is, uh, the fact is that, as I said, 100 million, more than 100 million Americans report that they have difficulty paying their bills means that even the health insurance we give them, this is, doesn't apply to Medicaid, but if the, the insurance plans that are bought on the, you know, for, under the Affordable Care Act or et cetera are insufficient. I'll tell you a fu one funny story. Many years ago, I was in France, and I had, uh, I, I had taken a hike uh, going up a small mountain, hill, I don't know. And it seemed very obvious where I was going and everything. And then it started to get dark, and I needed to go down, back to the main road. And then suddenly I discovered that I was walking parallel, not descending. And I really panicked. So I decided, I don't know what the right road is, I'm going to go through the brush and make my, make my way. I saw a, ro a car road f not far ahead. By the time I got to the car road, you should forgive me, I looked like Christ on the cross. I, my, my body was completely lacerated. So a good friend took me to an emergency room, and they cleaned me up and whatever, and, and then I took out my credit card. And the person said, what's that for? I said, well, you just provided me a service. And the nurse practitioner said, but this is an emergency room. We don't charge for that. I was so stunned by that because the first thing you see when you walk into an emergency room in the United States is someone asking you, what's your insurance coverage? Anyway. Called the wallet biopsy. <laughs> OK, I think we're ready for Thank you very here. much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great, my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Nir Eyal. He's the Henry Rutgers bioethics professor um, and also a former colleague of mine at Rutgers. So it's really a pleasure to be able to welcome here with us today um, uh, and is also the uh, uh, director of the Center for Population Level Bioethics. 
Dr. Uh, Nir Ayel is a doctorate of philosophy from Oxford University and postdoctoral training at the National Institute of Health. Uh, he also uh, spent time at Princeton University in their Center for Human Values. Uh, and prior to arriving to Rutgers, was at the T.H. Uh, Chan uh, School of Public Health at Harvard University uh, with an affiliation both at the Law School and the Arts and Sciences School. Uh, Dr. Uh, Eyal is also uh, a bioethicist in the field of population and public health, and so it's really wonderful to have two leading experts in the field of population and public health bioethicists with us today. I think these talks will be wonderfully complementary and synergistic and really allow for us to think through some of the major issues that we now confront as a country with respect to how we advance population um, health ethics in this current uh, um, urgent moment of addressing the public health of all of our communities. Uh, Dr. Uh, Eyal's work has looked at uh, questions of bystander risk uh, as well as uh, ethics of human challenge trials of which he will be speaking today. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Tom, uh, uh, for the gracious invitation and everybody for coming. Uh, and thank you, Ron, for a wonderful talk. Um, the common denominator, if you will, between the two talks is look beyond individual patient care and the norms that are often associated with that so when you are thinking about the public self. Challenge trials on human volunteers are becoming much more common than they used to be, um, say, 20 years ago. Um, in a minute, we'll explain what challenge trials are, um, but there have been challenge trials for COVID, um, and there is more ongoing uh, and, and about to commence. At, um, uh, so these were in London, and um, uh, there is more in Oxford. Um, a challenge trial for Zika is ongoing at Hopkins, and people are talking much more seriously about conducting a challenge trial for hep C uh, to develop a, to, to test the efficacy of a vaccine candidate. Uh, what are challenge trials? Um, we're gonna talk about what they are and um, then about their potential value. Uh, HCTs will be the uh, acronym for human challenge trials um, in uh, vaccine testing and address objections to uh, conduct them focusing all along on the context of COVID and challenge trials uh, for that disease. Um, let's start with what they are. A human challenge trial is a trial where trialists intentionally expose participants to a pathogen. That is what makes it ethically controversial. We never in medical care try to expose patients to a pathogen, but this is exactly what a human challenge trial does to human participants. Depending on the design, depending on the circumstances, it can advance our scientific and medical knowledge in a certain way. You can learn certain things from it, a variety of different things. So for example, in a simple design for a COVID uh, vaccine uh, challenge trial that would check the efficacy of a COVID vaccine, this by the way is not the kind of uh, challenge trial that was conducted in Imperial College in London. What happens there is that you have a very small number of volunteers who consent to what I've just said, to being exposed to a virus and to the rest of uh, the details of the trial. They go to some medical facility and are randomized to, say, uh, intervention versus control. And then all are exposed deliberately to the virus. Soon thereafter, the intervention arm gets the vaccine candidate. Say it could have been, you know, in the first place, the vaccine candidates that we initially approved for COVID, or uh, more contemporaneously, maybe a vaccine candidate that has some advantage over those. It can be administered orally. It can uh, be delivered more easily in, in developing countries. And if there are big differences between the people who got the vaccine and those who didn't get the vaccine, that's a sign the vaccine works and is very efficacious. If there aren't big differences, then uh, you know that, or presumably the vaccine uh, is not very efficacious. I'll focus specifically on um, a challenge trial with roughly that kind of design for the 
purposes of this talk. But a lot of it we, we could also discuss in the questions uh, applies to other designs that would try to, do, to achieve other things by exposing people intentionally to a pathogen. So I mentioned that in uh, Imperial College, they've completed uh, uh, a challenge trial for um, COVID. I'll give you a, a few details uh, on it. It was a sort of public-private partnership. Um, and it, was a, it wasn't like what I've descri described now. It was a single-arm trial that basically followed uh, people and gave them a lot of exams um, um, once they were exposed. So there was no, it wasn't to test a vaccine. It was just to see the natural development of the disease uh, and, and answer a variety of questions. These were people who were isolated in a facility in London, bored. You can give them a lot of exams. They're, uh, I'll argue later, they, they were uh, largely there because of altruism. They want to help. They're bored. You can test a lot of stuff on them. Uh, and the researchers found a bunch of things. Um, um, not, I would say, groundbreaking, uh, but um, interesting and somewhat more rigorously um, proven than what was known at the time uh, from other uh, methods. Um, uh, there were um, no severe adverse events, although one volunteer lost their sense of smell uh, for uh, months afterwards. The standard package, if we're talking about challenge trials, uh, is you try to minimize the risk, of course, to the volunteers when you expose them to the pathogen. And say, in COVID, uh, the most straightforward way of doing that is not so much what you do, but the people you select. You select, COVID has, had, set, has such a huge age gradient, you select young adults, adults because the, the quality of their consent is higher than pediatric um, subjects. Um, so maybe people in their 20s. Uh, you um, select them to be healthy, so the comorbidities issues is not there. And um, you give them excellent access, preferred access, even at the time of critical shortages and critical care. Uh, you give them excellent access to care, uh, should that uh, become necessary. Nowadays, uh, the time when people were discussing that, we didn't have therapeutics for COVID, of course. Now that would be part of the regimen. Um, and they remain isolated so that you don't have um, uh, Tom Mackey mentioned that I also work on research bystanders. These are people who are not subjects, who are being put at risk by medical trials. And the paradigm example is the contact of somebody who is in a challenge study. They are not subject, but if the person goes home and infects their family, uh, then they may suffer and they're actually not in a medical facility. They might not be detected. So it's, it's, it's actually quite important. And the phenomenon of bystanders is very widespread and uh, very interesting uh, to explore. How do we think about the ethics of how we treat them? But you really can sever that if you isolate them until they're no longer infectious. There are interesting questions about that. Do we have a right to you know, block people who committed no crime in a certain medical facility and it, until they're no longer infectious? There are some uh, preparatory and posterior steps that you need to uh, have in order to have a challenge trial. Um, uh, you need to, say, grow culture, a virus. Um, you need to do a dose escalation study. I'm not going to go into these technicalities. You need to convert facilities. These take time. There are some things that you can do to cut uh, some of that time. For example, Mark Lipsich and I uh, proposed a design for challenge trials that doesn't use cultured virus, basically it's a, uh, not a good way to sell it, but I'll just, to clarify what we're talking about, it's a kind of corona party, if you will. Um, and uh, there are also posterior steps. Um, challenge trials are on a very small group of volunteers. You don't get information about safety from them. Safety events are rare. It's not enough statistically for anything that is adequate. And you selected for young and healthy volunteers, you don't know what this does in other populations. So you need to think of maybe through immune bridging studies how to um, transfer the knowledge, to generalize the knowledge to additional populations. 
I want to start by arguing that there was some value, uh, considerable value, in conducting um, John Strauss, um say, in a situation of a pandemic like COVID. Um, so I was actually the first author of the first peer-reviewed paper that suggested conducting challenge trials um, for COVID with Mark, whom I mentioned already, and uh, Peter Smith uh, from London. Um, soon thereafter, there were additional papers, including a WHO working group paper that were also calling for that. Um, the Scheidt uh, paper I mentioned here is actually not, it's disgusting that it was ambivalent about whether it's for or against. We, um, um, I, I believe that there would be also roles for challenge trials uh, for COVID um, later on in the pandemic, uh, not just in these early stages of um, um, discovering the first vaccine. Um, I'm listing some roles here. You can imagine others. Um, um, importantly, one of those roles is identifying the correlates of vaccine protection um, and its duration. In a, we'll come back to that later. Um, some of these roles uh, remain, I think, pertinent, um, but um, uh, certainly extended, uh, they, they remain pertinent even after the initial stage of um, vaccine discovery. Um, I'm going to skip some slides. Um, the main reason why challenge trials in the context of a pandemic can be um, of great social value is that they are an expedited design so you don't, in a conventional field trial, like the ones that we've conducted to discover the vaccines, you wait for uh, enough cases to emerge uh, of people naturally getting infected in their home environments um, so that you will see a difference between your intervention arm and the control arm. The intervention arm that got the vaccine candidate, say Moderna, and the control arm that got placebo. And that takes a while, and it also costs a lot of money because in order to make it not so long, we needed to have had huge uh, numbers of volunteers. In a challenge trial, you don't need to wait, and you just go ahead and expose everybody to the virus, and that's also why you need so far fewer cases. It's really just a few dozen volunteers that would achieve the same statistical power as these huge trials that we had uh, in terms of checking the efficacy in that uh, population. And the huge scale of a pandemic makes expediting the process extremely important for global public health. We, uh, at the time, wrote under the impression that everybody was under at the time that we could still achieve herd immunity if we act fast enough. We were outraged that in spring 2020, uh, the United States under Donald Trump was doing everything not to do anything about um, the pandemic. Um, we thought we could still catch it if we act fast enough and it won't become uh, the huge killer that it would be. So we projected the IMF and World Bank um, numbers at the time, the expectation with what was expected to be exponential growth in um, mortality. Um, and uh, we said, if you look at the numbers, it's just going to have a huge, huge, huge effect to expedite the processes for discovering initially the vaccine. Um, but I believe that there are also additional roles uh, that are relevant also after the vaccine was discovered. Um, and they, in a pandemic context, can have a lot of value. I'm going to skip more details here. Um, as mentioned, um, Conventional phase three uh, field trials um, um, take longer early in the pandemic and late in the pandemic, they're also hard to justify because at that point, um, around a study site, um, well, first there would be the challenges that always exist in, um, in um, field trials. Uh, it depends on what's going on around the study site. If uh, So the AstraZeneca, if you remember, trial in spring 2020 in England had to move to Brazil and South Africa because for a minute Boris Johnson became serious about uh, COVID and then cases declined in the UK and there weren't enough natural cases to sustain uh, the trial. So they had to start completely new sites elsewhere. Um, and that, that, that uh, continues also late in the pandemic 
development, but um, more specifically to the uh, late in the disease, um, if you want to have anything like a placebo uh, design, that requires withholding the vaccine from thousands of placebo volunteers, jeopardizing both them and, remember the bystanders, their non-consenting contact, and that is ethically problematic. Um, um, it's also impossible to find enough participants in these great numbers with neither natural nor vaccine-based protection if you want to have uh, to test that. Um, nowadays, I think we're, we would give up on, on trying to find volunteers with neither, but there was a, a long period where we could have found just a few dozen people without uh, those um, either uh, natural or vaccine-based protection and use that for our uh, designs. So that wasn't available in um, conventional trials, but available in challenge trials. Uh, and, and if you want to do an equivalency design that compares two vaccine candidates, one to the other, both somewhat efficacious, but you want to check which is more, more efficacious and by how much, that requires even greater numbers of volunteers for statistical reasons, and that's um, even less realistic to achieve at some point in the uh, pandemic with conventional designs, but realistic with these small numbers would be an increase on a few dozen volunteers, not a huge increase, so still realistic to do. But there were many objections to challenge trials, and I want to um, discuss uh, the ethics of, of this design um, as well. I just realized that I forgot to press um, uh, to activate my uh, time, my watch, so I'm looking for Tom to tell me when I started. Fantastic. All right. A lot of objections. Um, I'm going to discuss first some that alleged that what I said about the social value of uh, these trials is not true. For a variety of reasons, they're, they're not generating the results that we, we, we need. And another set of objections, which is even kind of more core ethical, was something like, look, maybe this is valuable, but you don't go ahead and expose people intentionally to, to pathogens just because you have something to gain from that. It's not ethical. So we'll run through the ones alleging low value. Um, after the, vaccine, the initial vaccines were discovered, a bunch of my colleagues argued that they're no longer uh, relevant. But, um, so I'm going to come back to this. But um, I argue that there are plenty of more roles remaining. And I've mentioned uh, briefly that there are some problems with conducting field trials. So they remain functional, I think, uh, even at this point. Uh, certainly at some earlier point in the pandemic, which were posterior to when we had the initial vaccines. They take a lot of time to set up, but there are ways to expedite that. Um, uh, there is no read on product safety. That's absolutely true. But um, there are, we suggested uh, in multiple uh, articles, different ways in which you could get that safety information through a separate stage, um, uh, even uh, as part of a complementary uh, field trial, which I think is also a, an interesting possibility um, to conduct both types of trials. An important, uh, maybe the strongest argument that there is really very little value in these trials is that you select, in order to minimize risk, only young, healthy adults for these trials. This is not the population that we're trying to de develop the vaccine uh, for the most. What do we do about that? And there were, um, that's basically, Demigadal is the article uh, by a group that NIH um, put together uh, in order to tell it what to do about this. So, um, and even earlier, NIH leadership, uh, Tony Fauci, uh, Francis Collins, and others wrote an article in Science exp expounding mainly this argument against uh, relying on child trials. So that was very much on their minds. Um, some of this problem arises also in field trials um, to represent every key population with uh, you know, with every comorbidity, uh, with guarantee of sufficient case accrual, is simply impossible. So for statistical reasons, you, you power the study to give you an answer, yes, no, not to answer about these uh, separate populations, even if you're going to multiply it by 
three so that you can talk about popula huge populations, subpopulations in between, um, you just do not have the statistical power to answer about every comorbidity and every um, um, ethnic racial group. Um, I think that there is now a culture of um, kind of diversifying um, clinical trial population that is sometimes um, a little too hopeful about the chance of doing that uh, uh, through clinical trials. That's an issue that I'm interested in. Uh, it's a very important goal, but I'm not sure that we can reach it. Uh, and that might be even harder um, when poor uh, countries tie to develop uh, trials to address their vaccine needs, which unfortunately rich countries uh, were not attuned enough for uh, during COVID. A possible solution is to conduct immune bridging studies in high-risk populations um, after you do your initial uh, efficacy study, either a field study that doesn't check for every population or a challenge trial. Immune bridging studies are ones where you check um, only whether in uh, the relevant population exposure, exposure just to the vaccine triggers what you know correlates with vaccine immune protection. Uh, and that's a, a, a strong sign and a very safe way of testing whether that population would be protected by the vaccine. But you need to know what correlates with um, vaccine uh, protection. And everybody agrees, including, say, Demony and Gadal, they write that, the best way of checking rigorously what uh, exactly are the correlates of vaccine protection is through a challenge design. So a challenge design, far from being um, super unsuccessful um, in helping us generalize results to um, many populations of patients, is actually an important stage for helping us uh, doing so. People wrote that it would undermine trust in vaccines. Um, we've had we had a huge problem of trust in vaccines. We continue to have a huge problem of trust, distrust of vaccines uh, in the general population. People don't take the vaccine. And um, they said, if you do this crazy thing, you infect people, like, they're going to, you know, uh, the vaccine skeptics will, will, will just uh, use, exploit that to give you so much trouble. Um, bioethicists were saying that a lot. Um, I believe it's become a, something of a fashion in, among my colleagues in bioethics to say, oh, this would undermine trust in doctors and public health authorities. And why are we saying those things? We are not empirical researchers. I'm not. My background is philosophy. How would we know? I mean, it's a complex science. What undermines trust? What builds trust? Um, the effects are very complex. If the vaccine trials last long, they're seen maybe like a sort of lame duck, and you know, maybe if you quickly get results, maybe that would build trust. It's a complex issue. Um, the only available data from spring 2020 um, suggested actually it's um, a study of a group that I was participate, uh, participate in, uh, the Brooklyn et al. Uh, we checked in eight, eight countries. Um, um, we compared two scenarios. One was, in fact, a conventional vaccine trial. Another was, in fact, a challenge trial, which ends faster, but is more risky for the participants. And there was uh, support across countries, um, interestingly, and I think reassuringly, less so in Hong Kong and Singapore, which are close to China. At the time, there were rumors that China is conducting unethical child trials without consent. So maybe that explains it. Um, um, both among Democrats and among Republicans in America uh, for conducting the challenge design. So we don't, we shouldn't, Biophysists like myself shouldn't presume that they know what the public would be agitated by, what uh, the public would oppose. Um, it's not part of our training. Um, it's true that a trial accident might dent that support. Um, we'll check later how high or, in fact, low is the risk of an accident. Um, people said approval agencies would never approve a vaccine candidate based on challenge trials, so what's the point? Well, the point is to try to convince the approval agencies to uh, change their habits and um, uh, convince, say, FDA or EMA 
uh, the European um, Medical Authority, um, Medicines Authority to um, use those designs. Um, um, and in any case, um, uh, there are also uses of child trials that complement field trials and increase the overall evidence, and surely uh, those would be relevant for uh, even conservative uh, vaccine approval uh, agencies. Um, people said that becomes a, a bit more about the ethics. Um, there are ethical issues. Sure, maybe it's got some value, but how can you, for an emerging infection, achieve informed consent? Nobody knows in, back in spring 2020 what SARS-CoV-2 do, infection does to you. What is the chance you'll be killed? What is, we, we, we didn't even know that long COVID exists. So how can the decision to participate in such a trial be informed? Without informed consent, the trial can't be ethical. I believe that in many medical trials, the subject and the researcher don't know what the intervention, which is merely experimental, will do to them. That's why it's experimental. They need to know the ranges. It couldn't be safer than this. It couldn't be riskier than this, if those are known to science. They shouldn't be cheated about anything. And they need to know, part of being informed is to be able to say, we don't know. This is an emerging infection. There is a lot we don't know about this one. If they tell us that when we check the comprehension, I think they could be, um, um, could, should count as informed for the purposes. We never have full information in any context in life. Science changes, right? If 20 years after a trial, science changes and the researchers realize, oh my God, we assured people about something which, which actually Science change, and we now know we gave them some incorrect assurances. That doesn't mean that they're guilty of battery. They were acting in lockstep with the scientific understanding of the time. So that, that's okay. It's not, so it's not about knowing the truth about what exactly this will do to you. It's about something that can be achieved. And in fact, there were big uncertainties, I believe, uh, also in the vaccine trials that we did conduct at the time. Um, one factor, for example, severity enhancement. We didn't know if the vaccine couldn't make exposure even worse for you. This has happened, had happened in other SARS uh, vaccine candidates in, in animal studies. Uh, and there was real fear in the Cori et al. the article with um, uh, Fauci and Collins that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they were afraid that this might be the case. Yet I remember I was, uh, uh, they were recruiting uh, Rutgers people for the J&J uh, &J trial. Um, so the consent form said something very minimal about severity enhancement, which we really, we really didn't know if it's not going to happen. Um, we were lucky and it didn't happen. Um, and the person who ex was trying to explain the consent form had no idea what this is about. Um, I think that was somewhat compromised quality of consent. In a small group of volunteers, uh, potentially highly educated, we're talk going to talk about that. Uh, you have a more realistic chance of achieving higher quality of consent, actually. When you need to, j, &J recruited 60,000 people, I can kind of understand why the quality of con the consent wasn't optimal. I'm not being accusatory here. People said it's going to uh, harp, mm, going to target the, the poor and the um, exploitable and the disenfranchised, the people who don't understand that this is risky business or the people who unjustly don't have access to critical care in their country or whatnot. Um, otherwise, why would anybody volunteer for this? Um, we surveyed, uh, so th shortly after we wrote our article, um, they said, inspired by our article, uh, emerged a global movement called One Day Sooner, uh, which um, now has 40,000 plus people registered there who said we would like to volunteer for COVID challenge trials. And now this movement has morphed into a movement of volunteers who want to work in other risky studies, including, say, other challenge studies that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, we surveyed them. They uh, are very highly educated, um, um, all right to do economically, um, uh, have access to healthcare, 
We also check the, the are, what is typical of them is altruism. Um, they are risk averse more than the control group that we surveyed of representative, uh, a sample of US, um, of Americans. Um, so they're more risk averse, but they're just altruistic and they understand what they're getting into. They're highly educated. They want to help. So when we think of trial volunteers, we often, in research ethics, we often have a picture of some of the most egregious uh, trials that have taken place and which totally exploited the lack of alternatives economically or medically or you know, uh, lack of health literacy. But there's nothing in the nature of health research that prevents also a sort of uh, idyllic situation. Um, and and uh, we should remain open to the possibility that we are talking about uh, volunteers who are not like in the worst uh, scare stories that I was uh, educated on when I was studying research ethics. It, it's something to guard against, but it's not necessary. Core issue is okay, but it's unfair to expose people to this level of risk. Even if they volunteer, that's not enough. You need to give them some sort of fair risk benefit um, calculation. Everybody agrees that there are three key ethical questions about the risk to the volunteer, um, especially in these early situations where we didn't have anything like therapeutics, anything to do, nothing to do if, if, if things start going south. One question, and that's again, that's not just say me, I'm in favor of challenge trials, but also say Seema Shah and colleagues who were, Seema Shah personally is against challenge trials. One question is whether the net risks to each volunteer um, have been minimized um, while keeping the study um, scientifically valid. WHO working group said, yes, there have been many measures, say, especially the choice of young, uh, healthy adults um, uh, that uh, provide that. But there are other questions. Is the social value of the study sufficient in order to warrant imposing these net risks on the participant. Note the way this question is phrased. The claim is not there is no net risk to the participant. The claim is not this is in the interest of their medical care. It's not in your interests. You know, I wouldn't, as a clinician, you wouldn't recommend under your hat as clinician to your patient to be part of that trial. But people do a lot of things for the sake of others. They volunteer, they donate money. You don't gain as much happiness. You, know, you gain maybe some happiness from donating money, but maybe not enough. You never, I donate some money, I, it makes me happy for two minutes after I, you know, I go, oh, well, great, great, great. But then that disappears and uh, I lost money, right? It's not good for you necessarily to act altruistically, but it's legitimate to act altruistically in many contexts. And if I'm right that there is social value, then uh, I want to argue if the social value, especially because in a pandemic situation, I argue the social value can be very high, um, this can be uh, enough. But there were also ones who said, okay, there is more social value than what is lost in prospect by the participant, but it's just not legit because what is lost is so extreme. You can't sacrifice individuals even for a lot of social value. There are some risks which are way beyond uh, what we can approve. There is a cap on how much risk there can be in clinical trials, even for the most important purposes. I'm going to zoom through um, a bunch of slides on this. This is not an element of the American regulations, but of some regulations around the world. Um, they do endorse this element three. Um, but I want to argue that the risk in these trials were much lower than imagined. Um, I'm going to zoom through a lot because I see Tom already giving me signs. Seema uh, Shaital um, uh, this mentioned the possibility that there is 1% of death. Then they kind of settled on uh, anything between um, 0.2 um, of a uh, percent and 0.03 of a percent. A month later, two of the authors published something uh, that said actually, whoops, I'm skipping a lot. Um, it's 0 .007. Um, eventually, um, David Mannheim and colleagues said it's this. It's 0 0.0026. That's um, 
much less than the um, risks initially uh, imagined. I, uh, if I had time, would argue that the truth is even a bit lower than that. Um, um, and it was, at the time, even a bit lower than that. Um, this is nowhere near the range, in a word, this is nowhere near the range that bioethicists who believe that there are some caps on the maximal risk to human uh, subjects, um, just because they throw out the number, it can't be above 1%, or it can't be above, it can't be the sort of risk of, say, organ transplantations for the sake of others that are beyond the pay, that are too dangerous. Um, uh, it's nowhere ne near the risk of, say, right liver lobe transplantation. Um, it's much safer, it was much safer than that. There are also f additional ways in the design to make it even uh, lower. I do want to mention one little thing, if I may. Uh, right now, there is a paper under consideration by Dave Winter and myself that argues right now, because basically Omicron uh, kills about an eighth of the people infected by it, that er then earlier state uh, strains killed, and JN1 in particular basically doesn't kill young, healthy volunteers. Um, um, the risks of death are way, um, sorry, are way uh, lower than they were even at the time. So the numbers now would be well below one in 100,000 chance of death. Uh, they may well be below one in 500,000 chance of death. And that puts it in a, in a special range which the federal regulations in 2018 call minimal risk studies. So that's really striking. I, I, even I am kind of a little puzzled by this. It, it means we can do it you know, expedited without consent. So um, certainly not the kind of trial that you would say, the US basically at the time said, that's for the Brits. We don't allow this kind of thing in America. That's not the sort of approach that you would take to such a study. Um, I, if I had time, I would discuss the risk of a terrible accident in such a trial, which might undermine public trust. Remember, in a word, there are only a few dozen volunteers, so the, the risks per individual, which is what we discussed so far, are multiplied not by a huge number. That would be the risk of a terrible accident in the trial at large, and I think that's also acceptable. Um, and I want to conclude and say that uh, these trials may turn out to facilitate um, uh, important discoveries even now, um, but um, and that uh, like other uh, medical trials and practices, uh, challenge trials to assess the efficacy of the vaccine candidates um, uh, at the time would have put participants at substantial risks, but um, that if done right, uh, the risks, um, which are not elim eliminable, remain acceptable, um, and that the other ethical objections to uh, conducting these trials can be met. Although, and that is, in a way, bring us back to uh, the connection to Ron's um, contribution, um, although they are not at all what a clinician would recommend to her own patient for medical reasons. Um, medical trials, I see here a lot of people in white robes. Some people have suggested maybe medical trials should be conducted by people in red robes or some other. It's not the same set of clinical obligations that uh, exist in the clinic. It's a sort of different ethical animal and we should think of the ethics of uh, clinical trials differently than the ethics of clinical care. Thank you. Great, uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Ariel. W wonderful talk, really fascinating. Um, I will go ahead and um, turn it over to um, uh, Sheldon here to ask the first question. Thank you so much, but I have um, two, two questions for you. One is about the role of, um, of, of regulators on this. So one of the most, in a sense, weird and famous trials was the hepatitis B vaccine, which came out in 1981 as the AIDS epidemic was going on. The vaccine was derived from the blood of gay men and IV drug users, because they had Australia antigen, uh, uh, antigen. The government said, this is safe. We did not know, we did not have an agent. 
We knew about prions, which we couldn't detect and couldn't denature. Is that a, so that's one example of, of a human trial, of a human trial uh, derived from blood of, of an infection in the population from which the vaccine was drawn. The second example of a, of a human trial was the birth control pill. The birth control pill, when it was initially licensed, okay, had more than 50 times the dose of estrogen that was needed. It was done on 50 people, 50 women initially, and then 200. And then once it was licensed, it was 10 million. So are these just examples of, regu of, of, of the regulators making a national trial, okay, with, uh, with no data. We had the hardest time in 1982 to try and get our house, staff, our house officers to take the hepatitis B vaccine. Perfectly reasonable. So where does that fit on your, your spectrum of things? Were these unethical decisions? Were these, I'd like to sort of hear your thoughts on it. It sounds like two examples, and I'm not familiar with the either of the cases uh, in detail. So it sounds like two cases were um, there was error. Uh, there should not have been the conclusion that this is ready uh, to roll, to roll out. Um, uh, I don't, in the first case, if I understand correctly, maybe a condonable error because it wasn't known. So if I, if I understand correctly, HIV infection wasn't a known thing back when, I see. So it was just negligence. Yeah, um, I, I'm happy that I'm not uh, here to protect their position. Dr. Ali, I had a, a question as well. I was really, I found really interesting the notion of the impossibility of informed consent. And I think one of the concerns that um, arise to me in the context of these human challenge trials is the potential for populations who are already systematically marginalized to potentially um, uh, shoulder a disproportionate amount of the risk for participation, whether that be through economic marginalization or otherwise. And I'm just curious if you could help us think through some of um, how, what we have to consider to ensure that this isn't a uh, disproportionately affecting communities that are already systematically marginalized in various ways. Great. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, Tom, we did actually survey the volunteer group from whom many of the actual trial volunteers in London and in Oxford now have come, and I think also the trial for Zika that is uh, happening in Hopkins. And um, they are uh, overall super kind of fine SES um, in, in the American context. Um, so it, it, so I, that's just to establish that it can happen, that it won't be the disenfranchised, et cetera. Um, one could take, you know, if, if you wanted, you could uh, exclude people unless they are, you know, do you have a, you know, so the person who founded One Day Sooner had his BA from Stanford. Do you, is it Stanford or is it just, uh, you know, uh, Rutgers? Uh, no, 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 competition. Right um, maybe we don't want to go there, but um, we do the same things that we do in uh, medical trials in general. What we do is we should check very well, not like the people check when they were trial to trying to recruit 60,000 volunteers on a short notice, but you know, um, ideally we should check comprehension. We have tests for that. Uh, it's like the computer programs that force all of us to uh, pretend to harass less than we in fact do, or yeah, you know what, you, you can't move to the next stage until you prove your comprehension level. Or, so, and um, uh, so, so these, this is already known uh, to research ethicists, how you can use those tools. People improve those tools. Um, so you use the, the usual tools. Um, if it's a trial which is especially risky or especially in the public's eye, and you really don't want anybody recruited just because uh, you know, of lack of health literacy or whatnot, or lack of any alternative, 
you could use an especially rigorous standard of informed consent. Uh, I would recommend, for example, something that might be useful for many clinical trials, um, that the team that conducts the informed consent drill is not the clinic, not the trial team. Um, these can be specialists in conveying information to lay populations, which scientists often, you know, that's an expertise that we lack. Um, and they are not as conflicted as the trialist who's trying to get, you know, recruit people and get this over with. They also shouldn't be accountable to the trial team in any way. So there are ways to, th so that's something that we should still develop. I, I, I would recommend that for many clinical trials, not just for these particularly risky clinical trials. Thank you. Do we have any last question for our speaker? Dr. Dr. Yale, thank you so much. This was a really fascinating conversation. Thanks so much for a great question. Thank you. Um, we'll go now um, transition to our next, uh, which is an interprofessional panel, which I'm really thrilled to have colleagues from across here at SUNY Downstate um, uh, with us. Oops, sorry, Dr. Yale. Um, uh, so um, if I could just ask that the panelists please come up, that would be great. Um, and. Uh, We'll just, if you could find a seat right here up at the front table, uh, and I'll quickly pull up uh, a slide set. Great, and uh, really wonderful to have uh, my esteemed colleagues with me here today. Um, you know, one of the strengths I think that we have here, I think we would all agree at Downstate, is the interprofessional nature of our composition as a health sciences university. Uh, and we have individuals from across our university with us today to speak about various aspects of an ethics of population health as it relates to their own profession and practice. Um, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled that we have this opportunity to learn from the interprofessional perspectives available to us here and to leverage the expertise of my colleagues in this conversation. So just to start, I, th I thank you all for being with us today and for um, taking on the mantle of you know a, a fairly have, I, re I recognize heavy charge of you know representing a profession which has diverse perspectives, et cetera. So I will only hold you accountable to representing your own. <laughs> um, but uh, I think we'll find a lot of opportunity here in leveraging um, this the different orientations that arise in thinking through questions of ethics as it pertains to public and population health. Um, and we will um, have uh, some uh, questions that I provided to the panelists in advance, and then uh, I'll have an opportunity for a question and answer session at the end of our talk. So I do encourage folks to think of questions you might have for our panel today as we go through our conversation. Um, and I, I thought that I would just um, start by locating us as we're thinking about this particular question of um, what our respective um, professions and our practice can in provide for insight in um, thinking about uh, ethics of population health with a definition of what population health is. Often we think of it as the health outcomes um, of a group of individuals, um, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. And I think the question of both the overall population health, but also the distribution comes back to some remarks that Dr. Bayer had been making in thinking about the imperative of uh, public health ethic with respect to both utilitarianism as well as justice. Um, and uh, needing to think about that in the context of our conversation today, I would encourage us to um, bring those uh, considerations to light. Uh, particularly as our shared mission here is so centrally um, to advance health equity and justice uh, here at Downstate. Um, so uh, as I had mentioned, uh, we have a really fabulous set of panelists with us today from across the university. Uh, we have our uh, College of Medicine represented um, with Dr. Booten Foster with us today, so really thrilled to have you. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kaufman <laughs> with us from the School of Health-Related Professions. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman. We have Dr. Roberts from the College of Nursing. Welcome. And uh, lastly, we have uh, Mr. Versfeldt, uh, who comes to us you know, rel relatively unusually from our uh, Office of General Counsel. And I think it will be really interesting to have some legal perspectives brought to bear on our conversation today. So thank you for joining us. Um, so just to get us started, um, I'll just ask that you each um, introduce yourself more fully, <laughs> and that was a very quick introduction, um, and that you offer from your professional le um, lens what you see as key ethical questions that confront our efforts to advance population health. Um, uh, what specific contributions might your specific ethical code within your professional practice have to offer as we think about advancing population health in ways that consider and integrate uh, strong ethical and value um, uh, in, our, in our practice? Uh, so, Mr. Russell, yeah. thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. 
Uh, so Will Versfeldt, again, I'm from the Office of General Counsel here at SUNY Downstate, so I'm technically the interim chief campus counsel for now. We've been blessed to have uh, a few other chief campus counsels. Oh, I'll go closer, sorry about that. Going back a uh, decade, so I'm, I'm happy to serve in that role uh, right now. Uh, and as Dr. Mackey said, I probably come to this from a bit of a different lens in that I frankly do not focus on population health in my day to day, right? I'm happy to go into what I do focus on, but certainly ethics is a big part of that. Uh, and so uh, I did want to shout out the previous speakers, Dr. Bayer, Dr. Ayal. I thought those both presentations were excellent. Uh, I found myself nodding along uh, and thinking especially about you know justice. That That is something that I do think about and that I do consider uh, in my role. So a little bit of background about uh, what the role is. I head the office. We have five attorneys here. Uh, each has a bit of a different uh, specialization. So we have someone um, who works on contracts, on procurement. Uh, we have someone who specializes in labor and employment. You know, we have thousands of employees here. Uh, someone who focuses on the clinical side. Her name is Lauren. She's excellent. If you ever need a, uh, uh, she's a, an RN as well. So we have we have a great team. Um, and basically, what we do is, as lawyers, uh, putting lawyer jokes aside, we, we really do have a very strong code of ethics that we must uh, abide by. Um, there's a model rules of professional conduct that uh, oversee um, ethical obligations on behalf of all attorneys nationwide. New York State has adopted a similar code. Um, and basically, the as it pertains to, I'd say, this topic most generally, um, it's a duty of honesty, right? It's a, it, it goes along with the informed consent and you know an IRB looking at human challenge trials and whatnot. Attorneys have to be honest both with their clients directly uh, and you know what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is advise our clients. Here are the risks. Here are, here are the opportunities if you want to engage um, in this endeavor, uh, and also our counterparts, right? In a in a litigation context, um, you know you you can't lie to a judge. You can't lie to the other side. You have to be upfront. You have to be ethical um, in that sense. If you don't you risk debarment, right? Um, and so those obligations um, are always in the back of our minds in counsel's office. Um, and indeed, it, it is um, something you got to think about. We do continuing legal, legal education, just as a lot of you do CMEs, right? Um, and you have to re-register with the bar and stay in good standing. All those things, um, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? You, you really got to stay on top of that. Uh, and that's an important part of our legal obligations. Thank you, Will. So hi everyone, Carla Buten Foster. I'm a faculty member in the College of Medicine. Um, I trained at SUNY Downstates. I'm a clinician internal um, medicine trained. And currently my role is as leading the Office of Diversity, Equity, um, sorry, Diversity Education and Research and the Office for Institutional Equity um, in the College of Medicine and the institution as a whole. So as a clinician, um, some of the pillars that we abide by include autonomy, benefic um, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And those are really integral to um, equity because without the ability to allow to enable our patients or to strengthen their ability to truly participate in medical decision making, um, then there isn't equity because we're not able to provide care that will give an opportunity for everyone to achieve their best health if they're not able to fully participate in decision making. Um, as clinicians and medical educators, we also must constantly weigh what we're doing, um, balance um, beneficence versus um, intentional um, male maleficence, um, non-maleficence versus beneficence. And in order for us to do that, we must look through a, an equity lens and really check our own biases because there are several examples um, in, in the literature and in science of clinicians and scientists doing things that they think are, um, you know, th that, that are done, I think, out of good intentions, um, but yet, as we heard from our speaker, that they have significant consequences. And then there's justice, and that's an area that we don't often talk about because we think that at least Traditionally, that's, that's, oh, that's a social science, a public health, um, a legal matter. But as clinicians, we are really, um, I think we, we must also stand on pillars of justice if we are to promote 
um, equity and create opportunities for all. So this discussion is very relevant to um, what we do in the College of Medicine and actually in, in all of our schools as, as health professionals and, and health educators. And, and you know, one of the things that I really like about Downstate is that we can have these discussions because we work with each other on a regular basis and there's this mutual respect for, for the institution that we can't do this alone and in order for us to advance equity that all of our, um, I guess, the, the ethical pillars on which we stand must really align toward um, equity. Great, thank you, Dr. Budenfoster. Dr. Ra, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Marie Claire Roberts from the College of Nursing, um, and I am a bit hesitant to <laughs> represent the entire body of nursing, um, and especially uh, in congruence with the conversation today because um, nursing spans inpatient and outpatient. And um, I really would like to proffer today that we're actually the bridge between public health and inpatient care. Because when I receive a patient to the med surge unit from the emergency room, I'm asking, where did you come from? And I'm already planning, where are you going back to? I need to understand what has impacted and contributed to you being in my inpatient um, care setting. Um, Nursing, we have our ANA code of ethics, the beneficence, non malfeasance, um, and justice. Uh, one of the primary roles that nurses have, and we teach them and infiltrate them with, is uh, the need to advocate. Again, a bridge. We advocate in the units uh, for them to get the care, to get safe and quality care. Uh, and then in the community setting, uh, the CDC hands us some protocol that is evidence-based, but if you don't eat bananas and peanut butter, then uh, we need to find a better solution to your diet, right? Um, and to this end, the nursing profession on a daily micro level is impaired with moral dilemmas and ethical dilemmas. Whether it's the, in the inpatient setting where I need to decide, is that patient who's telling me right now they're going to commit suicide, or the patient who's tanking and I know is going to be need a code in about five seconds flat, where do I go? What do I do? We operationalize the ethical philosophies and values that we as a society think about. We live them and we do them every single day. And a big problem, again, that we encounter in the public health setting is remuneration. As a public health nurse, I get zero dollars. We are not valued in the space of community-based setting unless it is remunerated. If I'm sent into a patient's home to take care of a wound care, I am expected to completely ignore the myriad of pills that are left untaken, the bacon that the patient is putting more salt onto, and I'm supposed to provide the wound care and leave. I know that this is a public health crisis. That is the hypertension, that is the diabetes, and that then is a massive problem. So our values, as we have to operationalize them as nurses, are magnified when they go from inpatient to outpatient. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave Kaufman. Um, I'm representing the program in health informatics in the school of health professions. Um, this has given me a lot of food for thought, and so I came in here with a set of ideas and a set of concerns, and they have grown after listening, seeing Dr. Bayer's and Dr. Ayal's talk. So broadly, uh, my profession and academic discipline uh, is concerned with uh, the development, implementation, evaluation of health information technology. We also work on the data science side of things, and so we want to translate um, information into usable data, uh, which can further be translated into knowledge and hopefully leading to action. Um, I, I think Dr. Bayer directly or indirectly made this point rather uh, eloquently, is that any introduction of a p p potential change uh, can sort of cut either way. So we think of technology as a potential to be a great equalizer. It can mitigate disparities and equities. 
but it could also amplify uh, that being surface or exacerbate, actually make, make things wor worse. And this is something that we need um, to be very concerned with. And we don't um, assume that any of that is on the basis of any malevolent act. In fact, in one subdiscipline, consumer health informatics, we have the explicit goal of reducing disparities. And you know, our funding, our grants are built around those ideas. And we develop technologies we, um, such as for telehealth, uh, for remote monitoring. Uh, we, we are not exclusively responsible for developing those. But you know, we play an important part in that. In that. And it, it definitely has the potential to make a significant difference but it might be an unequal balance. And those who have less access to these set of technologies are at a disadvantage. So despite best intentions, we are in fact exacerbating um, inequities and disparities. Um, I have a list of things, I won't go through all of them, uh, but one is EHR documentation and built-in bias. And as we increasingly leverage that data, for example, uh, in AI, uh, that bias becomes further sustained. And there's a lot of interesting, it's not well understood. Uh, for example, just one example, is that um, this was a study at New York Presbyterian Hospital uh, that blacks and Hispanics had poorer documentation uh, than, so my, my, the minority population, um, their um, patient profile was more poorly documented. There was less information available, and um, and you know that's something that needs to be further understood. Um, other issue is the spread of disinformation, and that goes hand in hand with public trust, and that's a complex issue. And we know that disinformation is spreading at a rapid pace, and it's having a real impact, and it's having a disproportionate impact on. Uh, populations that are, for example, lower in health literacy and, and so forth. Um, one other, actually two quick other points. One is institutional inequity. So there's a lot of work on health disparities, um, but you know institutions are differentially resourced. So we saw that had tremendous impact um, at downstate, you know, at the height of the pandemic. So public health agencies, for example, required a significant increase in reporting. In fact, the level of public health reporting literally increased by an order of magnitude. And certain institutions were better positioned to do that. They had the technology, they could generate reports effortlessly, while downstate and other smaller institutions had to do a lot of that work manually. And they had to uh, position staff, including clinical staff, in gathering that data. So that's one example of an institutional inequity. And institutional inequities are tied um, in significant ways with health disparities. Uh, my last point, and I think I've gone on a little bit too long, uh, is around the issue of discontinuity of care. Uh, it's something that we're just beginning to study. Uh, we're working particularly with stroke patients. And we note that um, a sizable most stroke patients present, I, I'm simplifying it because there's a lot of complexity in this, but will present to an ER and, um, you know, they'll be treated, they'll, some will be admitted for short periods of time, some longer periods of time, and they're put on a treatment plan, but a very large percentage of them don't show up for follow-up. And that is a puzzling thing, and it's probably true, I'm speculating here, of a lot of other chronic conditions creating uh, discontinuity. And um, the issue with, stroke, with strokes is that if you can mitigate, if you can mediate, if you can reduce blood pressure, um, which is almost a low-hanging fruit, you can signif significantly reduce the risk uh, of a second stroke, and that's a, that's a lost opportunity. Wonderful, and, and thank you so much. Those are just uh, really insightful reflections. And um, you know, as I think about public health, and in particularly my role as chair of health policy and management here at Downstate, I was thinking about how um, 
you know, so critical to the ethics of public health, as we've heard today um, from our speakers, is the consideration of the health of populations and individuals, right, both, um, uh, through both practices and policies that facilitate the fair and just distribution of resources, right? So as you were each speaking, I was thinking of various ways within which, you know, in, in many ways, the, the mandate of public health um, is, is to facilitate um, you know, often up, upstream, right? Thinking through the structural systems and ways that we could facilitate uh, equity and fair distribution of resource in just ways uh, through a variety of different preventative um, and, 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 and frankly, secondary and tertiary prevention as well. I mean, we as a, a, a practice are thinking about the full trajectory of a, a disease condition, but we often, I think also recognize and ways that are so critical as Dr. Roberts was mentioning, just the need to address not just healthcare as Dr. Bayer was urging for us, but also the social systems that surround the determinants of health um, and healthcare. Um, and so, um, uh, and I was also reflecting that in our ethical code is um, a real uh, a mandate to kind of for, for protection of the individual and collective rights um, to health. Um, and so I was thinking of Mr. Uh, uh, to, to Will's comments um, with respect to um, you know the need to to really think about what folks have as rights, and we are often in public health, I would say, balancing the the population and the collective right to health with that of the individual autonomy um, and rights for the individual to have control over their own health and health care. Um, and so um, many of our ethical conundrums and the things that we spend time thinking about are trying to balance. Um, and as you were each speaking, I was hearing as well a lot of consideration for the trade-offs, right? That, that much of our practice is about facilitating a consideration of multiple ethical um, mandates that sometimes are in conflict or create tension for our practice um, and that we have to come, we, we fall down, whether implicitly or explicitly, in, in following through with one set of values. And I was appreciating in our conversations and the earlier talks today, there was also a lot of trade off, right? Like there was trade offs at the forefront of our consideration as we think about ethical dilemmas. And so the last thing I'll just say that I think is increasingly important to recognize and respect to public health and our professional ethic is just the um, is is uh, our we just have had a new code of ethic come out from the APHA, and this incorporates a respect for ecologies in a way that prior um, uh, codes of ethics in public health haven't explicitly uh, recognized in quite the same way. And so I think I would just also offer that a public health ethic also considers the ecology, the environments within which we are located, and is forced to reckon with um, what the impact of our actions are on the environment and on the um, climate and the, the worlds within which we inhabit in, in multiple ways. So, um, uh, and I think we, we began to kind of pick up on this, but I'll just turn to the, the panelists around, um, you know, what, what, where are the learnings for us to think about how to um, advance public health and population health from your respective um, professions? And so um, just would love to hear thoughts about how um, your field can offer um, uh, uh, advancement in our consideration of those debates, those tensions, those challenges that confront advancing population and public health. I'm happy to <clears throat> take, take this one first. Um, I think that you hit it directly on the head in terms of balancing between an in individual's autonomy and then you know the, that of the herd, right? And I use that deliberately because the, the largest example recently, at least in our line of work in council's office, obviously it affected everyone, uh, was COVID and it was the vaccine mandate, right? Um, my office was really involved in that uh, in terms of its enforcement here on campus. Uh, and I, you know, the enforcement is an important aspect because the Department of Health uh, in its wisdom said that healthcare workers have to get take this vaccine, right? Uh, and then it sort of fell on each, um, each institution to make sure that that was followed. As you would imagine, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback on that. Uh, some people, um, for various reasons, were skeptical of the vaccine. <clears throat> um, and I, I will say, you know, a couple years later now, I think downstate actually fared pretty well. Uh, SUNY um, Office of General Counsel writ large, right, it, it, across 64 campuses, 29 state ops, three academic medical centers. Um, for the most part, downstate had 
the fewest hiccups in terms of its enforcement. Um, and I think that was in large part due to Dr. Riley's um, leadership where he basically said, hey, if you work in this building, and it is just one big building, um, you're a healthcare worker. And I was like, well, I don't see patients. Do I have to get it? But I happen to be a, a huge advocate of uh, vaccines, so I, I gladly got it. But um, but it, it was, and it for a long time remained a hot topic um, among our workforce, right? Because if someone declined to get it for whatever reason, whether it was a philosophical objection or a, a medical objection, right, we had to make sure that there were pathways where that individual's autonomy could be respected. Um, and of course, I want to be clear, in some cases, um, they were overridden, right? You, if you insist on not getting the vaccine and you don't have a legitimate medical reason for it, you can't work here anymore, right? And that, that's, that's a very difficult um, conversation to have. Um, I, again, I thought we did quite well overall with the benefit of hindsight um, in respecting people um, and offering sort of a, a compassion uh, when, when the differing philosophical objections were strong enough that like, you know, I'm willing to lose my job or technically be suspended uh, during the pendency of that regulation. And of course, looking back more recently, um, that regulation from the DOH has been challenged in court as a lot of people expected it would be. Um, and of course, different courts come down differently on, on whether it was a legitimate uh, regulation that the DOH tried to implement. But um, again, not necessarily to compare across campuses, but we had a whole slew of people who um, you know, went through the process. Uh, it happened to go through the Office of Employee and Labor Relations, right? Um, if you didn't want to get unionized or didn't want to get vaccinated, um, here's what would happen, right? We had a lot of cases, but we had far fewer cases than uh, our counterparts at Stony Brook and SUNY Upstate in Syracuse. Um, and again, I, I don't think that's necessarily because we had all the answers, uh, but it, it just, we, I think we're clear eyed uh, about what was necessary and how we could best serve uh, our patient population. Um, because of course there were very legitimate concerns about coverage, right? If you, if you lose 30% of your nurses, like you can't, can't function as a hospital. Um, so it was obviously a very difficult time um, and something that my office actually was involved in from a, from a uh, you know, population health standpoint. Um, we had to step up and take a major role there and just try to balance the, both the enforcement under the law, right? That's what we try to do. We enforce regulations, we enforce the law, um, but also trying to keep an eye on uh, the various reasons and uh, some are, you know, very legitimate uh, why people would not want to um, abide by that regulation. So that, that, that was a uh, very real world example from our perspective in council's office. I think in, in terms of um, challenges that confront um, professional workforces or specifically as, as a clinician, for me it, it would really be going back to the balance of doing good um, and avoiding harm and how we conceptualize race. So there's still a lot of practice that's race-based. A lot of the literature will ascribe poor outcomes to one group based on race and even population health as a study. Um, we look at outcomes, you know, racial, ethnic minorities, minoritized groups versus non-minoritized groups, so this group versus that group, without really understanding um, or going deep into how these constructs were developed. And then when we, when we don't take the step to do that, we perpetuate um, racism in the practice of medicine, for instance, um, EGFR. So the estimation of glomerular filtration rate in, in um, renal function, this, well, 2022, I believe you were involved in that also. Um, we, with the help of the New York City Department of Health, we were able to um, effectively remove race from this coefficient. And that's really important because when we look at race in coefficients, they either underestimate potential risk and therefore may delay referrals, may delay removal of um, harmful medications, whether it's aspirin in someone with renal insufficiency, or delay referrals to nephrologists for transplant. Um, when we include race in formulas, um, vaginal birth after cesarean section, we overestimate risk. And then that leads to more women of color or people of color undergoing C-sections just based on race, and that's often just defined by the provider. And the, the message that a person who's, a, 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 um, who's about to give birth and deciding, they'll say, well, because of the way I think you look, 
I would recommend this. And this is what the science shows. So it's manipulating science um, in a way that perpetuates disparities. Um, pulmonary function test, really underestimating risk because of this misconception of, of, of bodies. And, and, I, and I think as a profession, we really have to take a look at how these algorithms and, and it were developed. You know, if we think about spirometry, um, it was developed, it was the... the, the, the the values that we use in spirometry and is, is based on the assumption that blacks' lungs were inferior um, and the solution was work <laughs> when, you, when you think about that. And then we use that um, misconception, misconceptualization of race, and we carry it forward, and, it, and, it, and, and it, it's used in... Insurance, it's used in, in, in um, definition of lung function, it's taught to our students, and we make treatments based on that. Um, so the way we think about race and genetics and make decisions and then teach our students who carry this information, there was this article a couple of years ago, students at, um, I believe is um, another academic institution, uh, um, assume that... Um, there were uh, differences in pain reception and pain fibers just based on one's race, and that led to the likelihood that they would treat. So the way, so it's 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 the science is so important. The science is so important, and if we're if we're if we are to advance science that drives practice and public health, we have to be scientific about it. And and race is not. Genetic, and, and I say this and I sound like a broken record, but race is not genetic. Race will change, right? If someone has, is, is biracial, what are they? It depends on what the physician is saying. So I, I think as we advance population health and collect data, we have to make sure that the data is correct. As we advance genomics, we have to make sure that we're not ascribing any type of genetic predisposition based on race. So we talk about sickle cell. Sickle cell is not a race disease. We know it's a, it's a genetic mutation and it's not based on race. You know, so as I think that's something that I struggle with as, as a clinician and now educator is to get st students, our learners, to think about when they see data and it says this group versus that group, what is it that we're measuring? Because whatever we collect, we measure incorrectly, and, and then we treat patients or develop clinical algorithms based on this misconception of, of race. So that's something that we really need to address if we are to advance equity in population health. Can we ask each other questions? Or, or do you want to go? Let's, um, we'll go through. I just want uh, to make sure we have right time for folks to, yeah, yeah, um, provide. I also, I'm going to ask, I'll just say this now, I'm going to ask Dr. Um, Yell and um, Bayer if they would like to give some reflections coming out of this last round of questions, um, and then we will come to a larger Q&A. Um, so, Dr. Roberts, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I think that part of our problems right now are that we're transposing a biomedical disease model which has driven healthcare provision in the inpatient setting and continuing to perpetuate it in the outpatient setting in public health. And I think uh, we have to have very in-depth conversations about that model and those models that we're imposing on the public health setting. Because again, it's what do we value, right? If we value disease, then we will create a structure to impose processes of a certain nature versus if we think about health and well-being. And then going to your point, who decides what health and well-being is? How is that defined? And what does that look like? And again, what are we imposing on a population in terms of um, the other and as the provider? Um, and so... From a nursing perspective, we come from a holistic model, 
Orem talks about self-care that has nothing to do with providers. It is actually the person in the community setting living with a disease process that has to care for themselves. There's no disease in there. There's no, um, you know, the traditional model that we see in the inpatient setting. And so I think the conversations are starting to be have had, but not enough. And we need to evaluate um, the outcomes and think about how we measure and evaluate public health in terms of our successes, because that then drives back how we design the structures and the processes and the systems to get those outcomes and to achieve those outcomes. Nurses are not at the table in the way that they should be. If we talk about and going to uh, the talk that we heard about in terms of challenge trials, just a micro example, a lot of the times the people who are getting informed consent in those trials are nurses. I cannot tell you the number of times that they stand with dilemmas because they're listening to that prospective trial member or participant and they have to deliver back to the people who designed those trials the reasons why that participant has concerns or might not want to continue in that trial. And we know that if you don't want to continue, you do not have to. But there's such pushback and the system is so strong and that advocate is not being heard or listened to. So I think nursing has to do a lot of work in advocating both at the public policy level as well as the public health uh, level in these conversations that we all desperately need to have. Thanks. Um, I'll pick up on this institutional in inequity issue. Uh, so broadly, our... can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, so, I'll pick up on the institutional inequity issue. Uh, so broadly, our discipline is committed uh, to furthering advances in health information technology. Um, and that's quite, a, it's, it's quite an exciting time uh, with advances in AI, with the availability of new technologies, with capabilities of decision support that we didn't have previously. Uh, and you know, there's parallel developments um, you know, Dr. Boutine Foster talked about uh, genomics and precision medicine and uh, the potential for breakthroughs in treatment of cancer and other diseases. Um, and, and I think the parallel uh, tells an interesting story uh, because they're not equally available at all institutions. And we have to understand that, and it's not a simple problem that could easily be rectified, but I think it's something we don't understand very well, particularly in relation, I could speak more to information technologies. And I think governmental agencies that create regulations and demands upon different institutions don't understand these sort of differences, um, and they're significant and they matter, and potentially they impact uh, patient care. Um, so, I'm not a health economist, and it's hard for me to get a handle on the full scope of trends in healthcare. For example, the effects of the mergers of hospitals, how New York Presbyterian and Mount Sinai is acquiring other hospitals, and how that's changing the landscape. It clearly is. And, but you still have smaller independent hospitals. Um, and um, purchasing power, like the ability to buy a first-class electronic health record system, which costs, I'm speculating here, <laughs> but upwards of $100 million. So we, we know that partners spent two point something billion dollars on the healthcare system, on, on their EHR, which, which was epic. And the Mayo Clinic, which has several campuses, spent something comparable to that. Um, so it's not available to everybody. And um, the distance between the premier electronic health record systems, like Epic and other ones, uh, continue to grow. And it's, it's not only the records, but it's the tools that are available and utilizing them and having the resources, having the staff and, and capabilities to do that. And it ripples throughout the system. So you have, um, for example, not the same decision support capabilities um, but also 
um, meeting basic public health needs like reporting. Reporting is, can be a very onerous process, particularly during a pandemic. And we did a study and we documented that. And, you know, the magnitude of the challenge was immense. And of course, it's not only uniquely downstate, um, but it's a problem that I think is not well understood. And I, I think there needs to be a, it's not a problem that's easily resolved, of course. It goes well beyond um, my pay grade. <laughs> There's a host of uh, obviously societal and economic issues. But it's something that we could develop a set of metrics and understand where each institution stands. And is there a minimum level of expectation? Like with electronic health record systems, for example, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health Information Technology has like a nine point scale. Um, and you're expected to meet, um, the government regulations were expected to meet a certain standard. Um, we have, but we have nothing, there needs to some, be something broader in scope relation to health information technology. Where, where does an institution stand? Um, you know, on basically measuring it. And what is the expectation regarding that? And do public health institutions need to do a set of adjustments on that basis? For example, in requiring reporting, in, in reporting requirements and so forth. I'm not sure, that, that last point needs probably some explanation, but I'll leave it at that for the moment. Great, thanks so much, and, and really a wonderful conversation. I'm gonna keep us moving because we are working through our time together uh, today, and I'm just gonna um, ask Dr. Bayer if you might share with us some of your reflections on the panel today. Thank you. Um, in listening to those of you who deal with uh, patients or are responsible for the care of patients, and as you come to grips with the fact that when you begin to understand the world from which your patients come, and when you come to believe that making, uh, uh, making it possible for them to be healthier take, will take much more than what you yourself can do in the context of a clinical relationship. So one of the things that's very striking to me is the answers to the social drivers of disease requires us to act as citizens, not as clinicians. You may discover things as clinicians, but recognize the only way in which there will be a solution is a political solution. That means acting as citizens. And uh, I know, you know, people in public health like to say that we do science. We don't like. To, we don't want to be politicized. I don't think you can have public health without politics, because the issues involved with the social drivers are political issues that we as a nation, we as a community must address. It really, uh, I'm reminded of the, um, the, the feminist um, adage um, of the personal is political and thinking through the same in respect to um, public and population health is political. And so thank you for those remarks. In a way, I want to pursue the same line. Um, so from my point of view, you're all, your hearts are in the right places. Uh, I've met over the years working in medical school environments and in public health school environments, a lot of people whose hearts are in the right place. I've hardly met anybody who says, oh, I'm indifferent to gaps. I only want the average of the population to be high. Or I'm indifferent to the average among the population. I only care about the rich. I mean, nobody says that. So. Why is the situation so bad? Um, is it, let's put our heads together and figure out what's going on. Is there some collective action problem? We all as individuals somehow strive for good, maybe in the clinic, maybe as advocates, but somehow it doesn't happen. Is it that I don't meet the, the influential people who are, you know, their hearts are in a very different place? Um, I tend to think it's more in the, more the former. I mean, yes, there are, you know, there is some selection bias, right? I wouldn't have worked for Liberty University or whatever. Um, um, but still, 
there is something about the system that maybe political scientists need to figure out, and that speaks a lot to what Ron is um, talking about. Doctors, not just as ordinary citizens, but as people who are trusted when they are advocates for health, population health, could have a lot of influence. And I'm wondering if, if not just doctors, also kind of all clinicians, um, if, if um, we shouldn't, when we educate students, educate them to see as a very big part of their responsibility to be advocates for population health under the recognition that housing and education and finances and all those things affect health no less than what's going on inside the clinic. Great, thank you, Dr. Al. Uh, I'll just turn to the panelists if you have any reflections on the comments that we have just heard. No, I, I, no, I, I definitely agree um, that population health um, improvement cannot occur only within the healthcare system. So um, if I think back to what we were able to do in, change, in terms of changing clinical algorithms, that really came from partnering with the City Department of Health. Um, they provided initial funding. Um, they provided us with resources and data um, that allowed us to, to do that. And that as, as educators and, and those of us who are charged with developing or, or um, supporting, rather, our future um, healthcare leaders, it's creating education outside of the four walls of the, of the institution, which includes partnering with communities. So community-based partners are very vital to our, um, to advancing health equity because they, they're not, <laughs> they're not, they can say um, and act without, you know, f concerns about what will happen to them. And they can um, talk politics and, and, and advocacy, and they can speak um, their, their true emotions, but, and, and, and providing opportunities for our students to be in those environments are really important for us to really advance. So it's really looking outside of, of the academic institution and, and placing healthcare in the community and, and leveraging the expertise of the community as well. Just want to quickly echo that we were recently funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute to conduct a study that actually at the leadership structure, MPI structure, is with a community based organization as the MPI with an academic investigator. and. The intervention itself is actually integrating uh, social determinant of health screening, but it also uses a volunteer base from the CBO to facilitate warm referrals to the services that are identified through the clinical care settings. And so I think we do have to think about these partnerships in really different ways, even in the delivery of care, how can we integrate um, the strengths of our community-based partners to facilitate even care delivery and healthcare contexts in new ways. And so in this particular partnership, the volunteer corps is trained in behavioral activation, as well as um, has resources available of, of the services that are available for particular types of identified social needs. Um, but the combination of behavioral activation with the um, services that are available that they are keeping abreast of um, are just service, like it's a, it's a partnership that leverages the strength of our respective entities, right? Like this is not a service that could happen easily within a healthcare con context, but is integral to the mission of our community-based organization and facilitating redress to the social determinants of health um, among their community members. So just, uh, I, I think uh, it's something I really resonated for me because we're about to embark upon the study, which is really trying to facilitate these types of community-based synergies in clinical care. So, thank you, Dr. I'd like to pick up on the point made by Dr. Baer where it's about a social revolution and it you know, um, ties into what you were saying. Um, I, I think that we need a tsunami because we have incredible initiatives and programs and what you see is they're funded, they do well, they perform well, and then they go away. Um, and that's a problem, right? So sustainability, viability. Um, if you look at, and I've had the privilege of working abroad um, in a sick fund system or universal payer system where the underpinning philosophy is primary care, community-based care. And so the programs don't go away. And you see the 
the outcomes then lining up. You have 11% reduction in readmission rates, right? So we, sh we have to continue with these initiatives. We have to continue coordinating between professions, between areas, between fields. We have to continue engaging the citizens and the people and the communities. Um, but we need to have societal conversations. What do we value? What are those underlying philosophies and values that translate into the policies and then dictate where the resource and how the resources are, are um, implemented? Uh, once again, picking up on a theme um, from Dr. Bayer's talk, uh, engines of change uh, serve to perpetuate inequalities, inequities, disparities. Um, what is, and, and I'm not saying that, it, I'm not adverse to progress. I think progress is extremely important. Um, but um, it's inherently unequal. And, um, and I think there are, historically, there have been both malevolent forces, but I'm really thinking about those that just seem to be self-perpetuating bias that's so ingrained in a system um, that we, you know, barely recognize it. It's just it's just a routine part of life, and we we even come to accept it in a way. We're challenging it. I mean, it's been challenged in the context of clinical trials. So clinical trials historically and today really tend to be homogenous populations with small percentage of minorities, and you know. When you apply clinical practice guidelines, you're drawing on those trials, and they may not be equally applicable. I'm not a physician, so I should be careful in <laughs> drawing strong conclusions. But you know, they may not be perfectly applicable to all populations. Um, there's a corrective mechanism in place with regards to that. I think NIH, it, if you're looking to get funded for a clinical trial, um, you have certain requirements NIH. Um, I, I'm less certain of this, but I think journals have expectations that you have a broader base trial and you endeavor to include minority populations and so forth. But I think at a broader societal level, and I'm thinking mostly of the introduction of technology and precision medicine and health information technology are sort of uh, two of the pillars that I'm most concerned about. And I, and I think without a fuller understanding of the dimensions and complexity of those issues, um, we, ha we run the risk of basically exacerbating inequities and disparities. Great, um, and I'm going to conclude our panel here. I wanna thank each of the panelists for your um, joining us today and for just a really wonderful and insightful conversation. So thank you each, yeah. Um, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Landsman, who is going to provide us with some concluding remarks for our symposium um, this afternoon. And uh, we'd just like to personally thank you all for joining us today, myself. Thanks. First of all, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank uh, Dr. Lazar, Dr. Mackey for helping to organize this, the Connolly Foundation, our two speakers, and my wife for coming, of course. Uh, um, just some uh, two quick minute reflection on this, we talk about personalized medicine going forward. So I would ask Ron and Nir to think about what did we do with these new monoclonal antibody medicines, which um, uh, Medicare says they have to pay for, and the charges are you know, $100,000 a year, $75,000 a year. This is personalized medicine, and it's most expensive, oftentimes for a minimal life expectancy benefit, um, which, is, which is something that we're moving towards more and more. You can see these advertisements on TV. I would ask folks to sort of think about that problem and how much we want to, uh, how much we want to deal with it. Um, the other thing I would lay out to our panelists and to our speakers is that we cannot afford all the care that individual people want. That's a I don't think we, we can do that. Uh, if you think about your own care or the care of your relatives, okay, at the highest level, uh, we really can't. Uh, and we have to sort of 
have some aspect of distributive justice in our allocation of health care dollars. Uh, other than that, I want to thank everybody and hope we, hopefully we will move forward uh, to be advocates. I'll just make one small, one of the things I do with my students and my residents to try and counteract this problem, especially in the population we serve at the county and here, is I tell them to put their telephone numbers on their medical records so, uh, and to give them to the family, to put them especially on the uh, discharge summaries. Because if you've ever wanted to get a hold of a doctor that you've seen, you know how difficult it is for us to do that. You can you imagine how difficult it must be for our patients, many of whom who live in a very different environment? Uh, you want them to have access to at least your number so they can call you up or they can have their new provider because uh, they change every time, call you up about what goes on. And that's, that's a small way of trying to ameliorate the communications problem. But thank you all and hope to see you again in the future. Bye-bye.